up, filmers? Welcome back to the Long Lens Podcast. This is a filmmaking Q&A podcast where I answer your questions and sometimes have guests on the show. But today is another Q&A episode. We do these every month. The beginning of the month, I ask for questions and then I try to answer them to the best of my abilities. I don't have all the answers, but we're going to get through them and hopefully I can shed some light on some of these questions that you have. But first order of business, how do you like this uh, lighting setup? I feel like it looks fairly decent. I'm shooting on my GH5 recording audio into the comic of vm30 again still haven't bought nine volt batteries for my freaking xlr adapter i think eventually i might just get that xlr adapter that just plugs right into the gh5 so i can just run an xlr mic right into it but rocking the little shotgun mic again today it's actually not that bad audio quality and again we're shooting in 1080p 10 bit that's how i normally record these podcasts so i don't have to worry about cards filling up too much so the way that this works is I always answer the questions that come in from my Patreon members first. If you wanted to join me on Patreon, you get to ask me questions there. I'll give you a little shout out on this podcast, but there's a bunch of different perks on my Patreon page. You get my $5 LUTs on my website for free, and there's a whole backlog of videos that I've uploaded there, and I've actually have them separated into collections now. So if you want to go check out all the videos that I've done on the GH5 or on the EM1 Mark II or on the GH3, you can just go to the collections on my Patreon page and you can see all the videos that I've done on any specific camera. So quick little plug, I hate constantly trying to plug my Patreon, but I definitely think that it's the best place to go if you just want a more direct contact with me. So we got four questions from Patreon, and the first one is from Dylan McMurdy, and Dylan asks, what's a good upgrade path from the GH3? I'm just a hobbyist, so top of the line specs aren't super necessary. Photo and video are equally important though, so I would prefer a hybrid shooter. Yeah, I mean, if you're from the GH3, I honestly can say that the GH5 is a pretty good upgrade path. It's not gonna be the most groundbreaking photo camera, but it's still a 20 megapixel sensor, which is pretty good. And it's a great video camera. I actually, I mean, it's, it's funny. I think I use my GH5 more than I use my S5-2X, just because I just love how small it is and it was really cheap. If you follow me on Patreon, you know that I got a crazy Facebook Marketplace deal on the GH5. So yeah, the GH5 is a great upgrade path from the GH3. Uh, uses the same batteries as your GH3 does and obviously the same lenses. All right, so next question is from Travis Shore and gotta give a little shout out to Travis. He's been doing some videos testing out my LUTs on his uh, T3i and like ADD footage. So you should go check out his channel if you wanna see what my cine style LUTs look like on other people's footage as opposed to just mine. And Travis asks, I've recently gotten a Cinco XLR shotgun mic for a great deal. Only problem is I have no way to record XLR. Any suggestions? I use an SL2 and an ADD at the moment. I wonder if I could run it straight into an old Zoom H4. Yeah, that's totally an option. You can run a XLR mic into like a zoom recorder and then run the line out into your camera if you didn't want to like, you know, separate system record. Uh, you could also get, I've used the, there's like these $25 XLR to 3.5 millimeter adapters with phantom power that run off of nine volt batteries. I have two of them. I have one by Comica and one by, I cannot remember the brand name, but I'll try to link them in the show notes below. And by the way, if you're an audio listener, there is a video version of this podcast you can check out on my second channel. It's called Nigel Barros 2. So you can see the links in either the show notes of this episode or the description of the video. All right, the next question is from Ivan Martinek. Ivan's another longtime supporter on Patreon. And Ivan asks, uh, when editing, what do you do first, color grading or sound design? I always color grade my stuff first just because I like to know how it's gonna look on the actual timeline. So yeah, I color grade my stuff first and then sound design is usually the last part. And if you've been following me for a while, you'll know that like, sound design isn't like my strongest suit right now. I'm trying to get better at it, but it's definitely the last part of the video process. Once I have everything in the timeline and I know what kind of sounds I need, and then I can start building the sound design after. And that's the last written message, but I actually have one audio message and I'm pretty sure it's from one of my Patreon supporters. I think it's from Andrew Mulcaster. I'm sorry if it's a different Andrew, but let's listen to that speak pipe message. Hey Nigel, it's Andrew. I love the podcast. My question is, do you shoot film photography or have you ever shot film photography? I know it's making a big comeback over the past couple years and it's really trendy. And I found that there's a lot of satisfaction in the de delayed gratification of not being able to see your photos right away and kind of waiting to see if they turned out or not. Is that something you're into? And have you thought about making videos on that topic? Um, also, another serious question that I've been thinking about a long time. Do you think um, it's really important to... So yeah, thanks for that message, Andrew. 
As far as film photography, I honestly haven't been as into it as I used to be. I used to have a little Olympus point and shoot film camera that I would shoot rolls of film on. And I had like all of these great memories on this one roll of film that I had shot over the course of like shooting all like these spec projects that I was working on back when I had my E1 Mark II. And I was so happy and like ready to send it in. And uh, I took the film out, got it ready to like, you know, send off to a developing lab and my dog got a hold of it and chewed it all up. And so all those memories are lost. Uh, and so ever since then, it's just kind of like killed my drive to uh, buy more film and shoot more film. I have been really intrigued by the whole Digicam revolution that's happened where everyone's shooting on old, you know, like mid early 2000s digital cameras and just using those instead of film, which I think is definitely more cost effective, which I might go down that route. I do like film photography. It's just not something that I'm like super, super interested in doing myself. I like watching other people do it. I've mentioned uh, Theo Crawford on this channel before, how I love watching his videos and he shoots a lot of film. I guess I like watching other people do it a lot more than I like doing it myself. <laughs> so yeah, maybe one of these days I'll decide to start shooting film again. I do have a few rolls in my mini fridge, so I might bust those out and you know put them in one of my old film cameras and shoot a little bit. But yeah, it hasn't been top priority for me for a while. Okay, and those are all of the questions from Patreon. Now we're gonna go to the YouTube community page. We got a lot of good questions there too. So if you're not a Patreon supporter, but you still wanna ask me a question, if you go to my main channel, Nigel Bajos, you can go to the community page. And in the beginning of the month, I'll put a Q&A ask, asking for questions. So you can go there and ask me questions too. I'm just not gonna read your name with the question. So first question is camcorder versus mirrorless camera for filmmaking. It's a pretty easy one. Uh, I would say mirrorless camera. The only advantages that a camcorder would have is a fast zoom and it's just kind of an all-in-one package, but typically camcorder sensors are very small and I, I don't know, there's a big spike in popularity for you know camcorders right now with the new Sony camera that got released, but I still, I don't know, there is part of me that's like, I see a lot of people saying, oh, I might switch, switch to a camcorder and I don't understand why. Like, it's a smaller sensor than my GH5 and I don't even think that new Sony camera has like a log profile. I don't know, it's weird. I can see merit for camcorders if you're like an action sports filmmaker or something like if you're a skate filmer, having a camcorder to shoot long lens, it makes a lot of sense. Shooting long lens on a mirrorless camera is not fun. You know, zooming on a zoom ring isn't the same as zooming on like a rocker dial. So camcorder for filming action sports makes sense, but for anything else, I would choose a mirrorless camera. All right, the next question is, hi Nigel, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Lumix S9. It sort of seems like it might be something that you could really enjoy for its form factor with the right small lenses. A mini cinematic machine. Have you tried it and are you interested? Uh, there's a few more questions in here, but I'm gonna address that first. I have tried it. If you watched the episode of me and Matthew Dengue, he came here to Oregon and he let me try his S9. And I liked it. It's essentially just a mini S5 II with no EVF and no physical shutter. I've been more and more intrigued with it. It's just the more and more I'm learning about sensors and readout speeds and like OLPFs, like the GH5 seems like a much better all round camera for me than even the S5 IIX for most cases because Things about the S5 IIX that I don't like are like the, the Moraine aliasing and the rolling shutter, which the GH5 actually does better at. So that's why I would prefer to use a GH5 almost than a S9 for just like run and gun type stuff. They go on saying, staying in the topic of full frame, do you think full frame lenses, excluding zooms, have come to a point which the size advantage over something like Micro Four Thirds or Super 35 is somewhat negligible. No, I don't think that there is any full frame lens that can come close to the size that a Micro Four Thirds lens can get. Show me a 28 millimeter full frame lens that can be as small as a 14 millimeter pancake on a Micro Four Thirds. I've seen some 28 millimeters that are just like these weird manual focus ones, but I'm not talking about manual focus weird seven artisan type lenses. I'm talking about true autofocus lenses that are 28 millimeters that are as small as the 14 millimeter pancake for Micro Four Thirds. You just really won't be able to right now. So until that time happens, I'm still convinced that Micro Four Thirds is the better way to go if you're trying to keep your kit as small as possible, strictly because the lenses are just going to be smaller. A 12 to 35 is always going to be smaller than any 24 to 70 for full frame. That's just the way it is. All right, the next question within that question is also, what are some features that you would like to see in an upcoming S1H successor? Mostly just 
phase detection autofocus, I guess. That would be the main thing. And hopefully a faster readout speed. Um, I have a whole video that I want to talk about just with readout speeds and rolling shutter and how cameras like the FX3 are just way better for most things because you're not going to experience as much rolling shutter. But those are the two things that I would like to see. Faster readout speeds and autofocus that works. The next question within that question is, I've noticed that you don't use matte boxes for your rigs. Do you have a particular reason and how do you deal with unwanted flares? I don't really try to like get rid of flares most of the time. Sometimes I think flares actually look kind of cool. Matte boxes, I feel like for most people are just like an aesthetic thing. They use them because they make their rig look cool. They don't actually need them most of the time. There's actually a trick that I do with a collapsible rubber lens hood. I did a whole video on them way back. I'll try to link it somewhere up there, but it's a collapsible lens hood that you can still screw the same filter size into. So if it's like a 77 millimeter rubber lens hood, you can still screw a 77 millimeter variable ND onto it. And so you can use variable ND, but still pop the lens hood out to cut out flares. So that's what I would do if I really needed to. I just think that most of the time, matte boxes just make the rig a little bit too big. I've used them in the past and you know they have helped, but I just, I try to keep my rig as small as possible when I can. So that's why I don't use them. All right, the last one within this question is, what's something that you used to think when you started your filmmaking journey that you can now see was wrong or vastly different? That's a really good question. And let me think about that for a little bit. Again, I don't read these questions beforehand and come up with answers. I'm just trying to answer it on the spot. I think one thing that I have come to realize is that gear definitely matters, but it matters less when you know what you're doing. So I know that there's a whole debate on this whole, like, you know, does gear matter? Does it not? I feel like when you know what you're doing, gear doesn't matter as much. When you don't know what you're doing, gear matters a lot because you think that the gear is what's making the image look good. But it's really like, I've seen people do amazing stuff with like very, very humble pieces of gear. So that's one thing I think is that like the, like the better I get at this craft, the less I think I need the best gear. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm using a GH5 right now. It's because like I know what I can do with a GH5. I don't feel like I need an FX3 to make good stuff, you know? I don't know. That's one thing that I would say. There's probably a lot if I thought about it more, but right off the cuff, that's what I would say. Okay, there's a lot of questions within that one, but now we're on to the next question. I don't know if you are involved in this niche, but in terms of dance photography, is there any way for contrast detection autofocus cameras Panasonic depth from defocus to keep the dancers in focus specifically in fast action and when set up on a gimbal. I would say probably not in the same way that phase detection would. Contrast based autofocus does work pretty well with photography, but not with video. If you were filming dancers, as long as you had enough light, I would just try to say stop down your lens a little bit and then just, you know figure out the distance that you're actually focused in. And then if you're moving on a gimbal, just try to keep that, you know, distance consistent with the dancers. Um, it might be hard if they're moving around a lot, but that's what I would do. Uh, contrast based autofocus can work sometimes. It's just not very consistent or reliable. So this next question is pretty relevant. It's asking, are you still using the Samyang 35 to 150? I'm strongly consider buying one, thinking it's a good all rounder for music videos and run and gun stuff, but I'm a little nervous about the weight. Would you still recommend it after having it for a while? Oops, almost dropped it. Yeah, so this is the lens. It's a pretty beefy lens, I'm not gonna lie. It's a hefty lens, like, I guess it just depends on what heavy is to you. This is definitely something that I wouldn't like to carry around all day, but if you have a well-balanced rig, this could be just, you know, part of your rig and it actually can help stabilize your footage too, depending on what, you know, camera you're using it on. So like this lens on like a Sigma FP would obviously be, be like really front heavy, but maybe it would help, you know, stabilize the Sigma FP. I believe that camera doesn't have uh, in body image stabilization, but if you put it on an S1H, like that whole I means gonna make your whole rig really, really big. But Samyang did just release a firmware update for this lens, which is pretty cool. It's firmware 2.1. I installed it already. It does help with some of the issues that I had with it. Honestly, though, the issues that I had with this lens were just based on the, I don't know, special features that they like 
we're trying to tote with this lens, like the dolly zoom and the parfocal, if you just use it like a normal lens, like just pretend that those features didn't exist and you just want to use it with, you know, good autofocus and just use it like a normal lens, it's great. But if you're expecting that parfocal and that dolly zoom to just work perfectly every single time, even with the new firmware update, it's not perfect. It helps. It's not perfect. So that's what I would say is that like buy this lens going into thinking that like it's just a normal lens. Pretend that these mode features didn't exist and you'll be happy with it, um, especially for the price. I think the Tam I think the Tamron version of this is a bit more expensive. This is only like fourteen hundred bucks, maybe a little bit less now. I think the price is starting to go down. But yeah, I really do like this lens and it could be a perfect all around lens. Um, 35 millimeter F2 looks really good on this guy. All right, next question is three years ago, I switched from the Nikon Z50 to the Olympus EM1 Mark II because of your video. And I've been very satisfied with it, especially in terms of IBIS image quality and lens support. Later, I opted for the OM system OM5 for its lighter weight and for its cold resistance, durability, dust proof capabilities. And I've been using it since then. Recently, I noticed that you switched back to Panasonic. And I wanted to ask if you were to get an additional B camera with similar features to the OM5, such as 3.5 millimeter mic input, log, OM log 400 or similar, good autofocus and IBIS with a micro four thirds body, would you recommend that I go back to the EM1 Mark II or buy a model like the G9 would be a better choice. Thanks for your advice. Yeah, I guess it just depends on how much you wanna spend. If you already have an OM5 and you wanted a more video centric camera, Getting the original OM-1 might be a better idea, you know, mostly because you're gonna have the same, you know, picture profiles and stuff like that. Uh, the original G9 isn't gonna be as good in autofocus as your OM-5 will, I'm pretty sure. So if you wanted to get a good Panasonic camera with autofocus, you need to go with the G9 Mark II. So those are your two options, like the OM-1 or the G9 Mark II. I guess it just depends on what your priorities are. If you like the Olympus, you know, cameras for like their durability and all that kind of stuff, the OM-1 might be a better option for you. You just have to like realize that there are compromises. I think that the G9 Mark II is a little bit bigger of a body. It's about the size of my s 52 x whereas the OM-1 seems a little bit smaller. Um, and the OM-1 does shoot in like a Rec 2020 color space, so you're gonna have to change that to Rec 709 when you're editing in most non-linear editors. So there's pros and cons for both, but if I were you, I would look into like a used OM-1 and just use your OM-5 as your B cam and the OM-1 as like your main camera. That's what I would do anyways. Okay, with your skate background, I'm curious as to why you don't shoot often with fish eyes. Also, thanks for getting me started on my biking filming with your channel, subsequently photography by proxy. Yeah, um, well, it's funny because the name of this podcast is called the Long Lens Podcast. And the reason I call it that is because when I was filming skateboarding, I feel like I really enjoyed shooting long lens a lot more than shooting fisheye. I feel like fisheye is kind of like a very staple skateboard look and it's great for filming lines or single tricks. But the only problem is that like, now that I've gotten a little bit more into like, you know, cinematography and filmmaking, the fisheye look just kind of is jarring for me. It just kind of makes things look a little bit more cheap. It's not to say that every fisheye angle is gonna look like that, but if I was making a skate video, I definitely would be shooting fisheye more, but I don't make skate videos anymore, really. I like filming skateboarding, but uh, unless the shot really calls for it, I try to avoid the fisheye as much as I can. And that's not any diss on fisheyes. I love the, you know, the look of fisheyes for skate videos, but for like cinematic stuff, I just try to avoid it. Um, and I'd rather film long lens, <laughs> hence the name of my podcast. It's kind of a sidebar, but like, I do think that there are a lot of filmmakers who are outside the skateboarding industry that you know, try to film with fish eyes and they make fish eyes shots look horrible because they're filming skateboarding wrong. The next question from a separate person actually kind of leads me into that, which is what is the cheapest fish eye for micro four thirds? And there are a lot of cheap fish eyes. You can go on eBay and find like an $80, like eight millimeter fish eye for micro four thirds. But I would say one of the best ones is like the Rokinon uh, eight millimeter F 3.5, something like that is good. I use that a lot with my G six back in the day when I filmed skateboarding. So I would look into that. If you wanted to spend a lot of money, there's some by Olympus and even Panasonic that are really expensive. They're autofocus ones, but I would go with something like a Rokinon or a Sam Yang, like eight millimeter. There's also some 6.5 millimeters. that will give you like a really, you know, circular fisheye look, but for most things, I think just an eight millimeter fisheye looks pretty good. All right, the last question for this podcast is, damn, I hope I made the cutoff. I didn't see this till now. I know you don't really do weddings anymore. 
What would it take to get you back into it? What about weddings didn't do it for you? I feel like the only things that get me amped these days are standout, not necessarily expensive wedding edits. Thanks. Yeah, so I did a lot of weddings back in my early to mid 20s and for the most part, I liked them. I think that I didn't really quite know what I was doing back then. You know, if I was gonna jump back into it now, I think that I would have a lot better grasp on how to like, you know, run a wedding videography business. So it doesn't seem as daunting now, but back then just, even just booking a year in advance was really, that was really intimidating for me saying, yeah, I promise in a year from now, I'll film your wedding. Because, you know, in my mid and early 20s, I didn't know what I was going to be doing like three months in the future, you know. So and I feel like I wanted to be a lot more free spirited and just say like, oh, if I want to go travel, I can just go do it whenever I want to. But when I booked a wedding, I had to be in town at that specific time. I couldn't be out doing whatever I wanted. So that was one of the things that kind of made me stop doing weddings so much. Um, another thing was I just think I didn't charge as much. And if I was going back to it now, I'd have to like be charging a lot more. If for some reason I wanted to get back into it, that would be like, I would need to be doing very like high end weddings in order for it to make sense for me at this point. But yeah, like, I don't know, wedding days are just stressful and they're long and I get so amped as I'm leaving a wedding saying, okay, I shot the whole wedding, it's over. But then the, there's like this sense of like depression that sits in maybe like the day after where it's like, oh crap, now I have to edit all of this and craft a story from it. And I really hope that the audio during the ceremony was good. And I hope I got the kiss in focus and all this different stuff is running through my mind. And so I'm culling through all the footage and you know, sometimes it worked out. Sometimes the audio clipped. Sometimes I forgot to press record and sometimes I missed a moment. It's just those types of things throughout my whole wedding filmmaking career that was just like stressed me out so much. And I don't know, I would only go back into it. I feel like if, for some reason I couldn't make being a commercial cinematographer work or if I couldn't make YouTube work. But even then I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to the bride and grooms if my heart really wasn't in it. And my heart just isn't in weddings anymore. Um, I didn't even hire a cinematographer for, for my own wedding. Uh, we, we had a photographer and that's it. Uh, it's funny, my buddy, he set up like an A6500 with a 70 to 200 on it and filmed uh, like the ceremony, but I still haven't seen that footage. I've been asking him, I was like, hey, maybe I should get that from you one day. Still haven't seen it. I've done a few weddings. I think in the last five years, I've done a couple of weddings, but they've just been my version of like a wedding gift to the bride and groom. Um, instead of giving them like a really expensive gift, I'll give you what would be a really expensive thing, which is wedding videography. And I'll give it to you for free. And that's how I would, you know, give a gift to my friends who are getting married. So, yeah, that's the main reason why I don't do weddings anymore. I just, I kind of grew out of it. I'm not saying that I'm too good to do weddings. I'm not, I just have found that I'm not as passionate about them now as I used to be. That's basically why. And those are all the questions that I have for this month. I'm gonna try to do another podcast either with a guest or I was even thinking with my wife, Sarah, just having her answer some of your guys' questions. So if that's something that you think would be fun, let me know in the comment section below. I think it'd be fun to get a little bit of her perspective, you know, being married to someone who's like a YouTuber, you know, self-employed entrepreneur type person. Anyways, yeah, that's all I have for this episode of the Long Ones podcast. I thank you so much for listening and watching if you're here on the YouTube channel. And yeah, go check out my Patreon and I'll leave links to any of the gear that I talked about in the description below. Anyways, thanks again. And I'll talk to you guys next time. Later. Later.